Miles Morales, the character that so many people pretend to like. Now I'm going to try to make this a contained video as I've gotten more than enough content out there speaking on this topic. But anytime you bring up Miles Morales being a derivative of Peter Parker, you're sure to get weirdos and plenty of Stan accounts very aggravated. In fact, if you want to get guaranteed engagement on sites like Twitter, simply say Miles Morales is Miles Morales and Peter Parker is Spider-Man. You'll get more brainless attempting to ratio you in the comments and quote tweets than you'll know what to do with. These crack smokers getting baited into flailing like no tomorrow is quite the treat. But my argument is that these people don't actually like Miles Morales, they like the idea of Miles Morales. What I mean by that is that these weirdos barely know anything about the character beyond the surface level. On top of that, it's indicative in the comic book sales that show they don't really have a genuine interest. Anything they know about Miles Morales is on the first page of some fandom wiki that they googled really fast. They don't even support this mess and at best they grab screenshots from a torrent website or that Marvel Unlimited app. Some of you may remember we actually caught some fake fan pretending to own more comics than me. His example of this was showing the books that come with this Marvel Unlimited app. He was too stupid to remember that there's a little red bar that shows how much you actually read. And this fool never got beyond the first page of the first issue of Ultimate Spider-Man, so he told on himself. I believe this is representative of most of the supposed supporters. Look, I have my own gripes about the character, but it's quite pathetic when I know more about and own more comic books based on Miles Morales than those so-called pretenders. Matter of fact, even got that first bad boy graded because I know I can sell it to some normie for maybe thousands of dollars in the future. The point of this video is not to just straight up crap on Miles as a character, but I will get this out of the way so newbies know where I stand. Miles Morales is a tokenized Spider-Man. I define what this means precisely in my masterpiece of a video titled Tokenism and Tokenization Explained. I don't care how you define it, long story short, it's the race, gender, sexuality, etc. swap of a pre-existing character. Sometimes this is just another created version of the character like Miles Morales or She-Hulk or Supergirl or it's just a character being depicted as something else in a new adaptation like Jimmy Olsen, let's say in the Supergirl show. As I've said many times before, all tokenizations are unoriginal but not all unoriginal characters are tokenizations. What I mean by that is that when it comes to characters like Robin or the other Flashes and so forth, yeah, you can make the argument that the second, third, or fourth versions of them aren't original, but like with the Robins outside of Stephanie Brown, white, straight, men, they're not tokenization, they're just unoriginal because they're the same makeup of the old character or the OG character that is. Before we get into this, let me quickly go through the straw man and or relevant things I know people are going to bring up in the comments. The definition of tokenization as I'm using it, I've already defined it. I'm not at all concerned how you'd use it. Number two, liking Miles Morales or the Spider-Verse movie is not an argument against whether or not he's a tokenized Spider-Man or as I call him, Peter Darker. The existence of other tokenized characters, including other spider folk, does not mean Miles isn't a tokenized Spider-Man. You liking him or others does not change the fact, nor do the supposed social ramifications of his existence change anything to that fact. Number four, Stan Lee's quote regarding anybody could see themselves in Spider-Man. It's largely taken out of context, but that does not mean that Miles isn't a tokenized Spider-Man. And number five, as I lay out these details of Miles and Peter, my point isn't to say that there aren't any differences, but rather those differences are largely superficial and do not negate their similarities. Number six, and perhaps the most important, in order to understand the tokenization, it doesn't just require you to understand who Miles is, which many of you don't anyway, but you also need to know about Peter Parker. This is why mentioning that the namesake is a mantle or griping that the other characters or about the other characters don't get as much slack, let's say, as Miles, that's a non-point. Miles ain't the only tokenized character. He's not even the only tokenized Spider-Man. He's not even the first tokenized Spider-Man. He's just one that many pretend to like the most. So let's focus on that. 
Mentioning these supposed inconsistencies, which I don't personally have on this subject anyway, is red herring at best. All tokenized characters aren't created equal. I cannot say that enough, but I mainly want to show how people pretend to like this character. Before we dive into that, let's get into some history lessons since people have selective memory. Let's first start with the creation of Miles Morales, which debuted to the world in 2011 in the Ultimate Universe. He's the love child of Axel Alonzo, Brian Michael Bendis, and Sarah Pacelli. Axel Alonzo stated multiple times that having a biracial Spider-Man was influenced in part by Barack Obama and him being biracial. It stated, and I quote, the obvious question was, when you have an iconic figure of this importance die, meaning Spider-Man, who do you replace him with? We've got a president right now of mixed ethnicity, so why not one of the biggest superheroes in the world? Another quote of his is, people who say this is a PC stunt missed the point. Miles Morales is a reflection of the culture in which we live. I love the fact that my son Tito will see a Spider-Man swinging through the sky whose last name is Morales. And judging from the response, I can see I'm not alone. So all opinions aside, he was first conceptualized for symbolic reason, to check a box. That's not my opinion. But back to Miles, in the actual books, we first got introduced to him in the fourth issue of the Ultimate Fallout after the death of Spider-Man arc. Keep in mind, this was in the Ultimate Universe, which is a little different from the main universe often referred to as Earth-616. The Ultimate Universe was Marvel's attempt to uselessly modernize and reimagine their heroes. The Spider-Man in the Ultimate Universe, though, was still Peter Parker. So Miles wasn't even the first Spider-Man in his own universe, a universe that predates Miles by a decade and had already been rebooted before. But here we are again, and this time some genius at Marvel Comics thought it was a good idea to kill off Peter and immediately replace him with Miles Morales. He was fighting crime in a Spider-Man suit and onlookers claimed that the suit he was wearing wasn't in good taste. And then after said introduction, he immediately gets his own universe comic Spider-Man book. So before we go any further, our first introduction to Miles was in a classic looking Spider-Man suit and then in a reboot of the Ultimate Comic Spider-Man. So his first series was just a reboot of Peter's comic in that universe. Either way, the first issue of Miles Ultimate Comics starts with Prowler, who we are going to talk about more in just a little bit, but breaking into Osborne Industries and on his way out, some juiced up spider goes into his bag. We then see Miles with his parents at a lottery for a charter school that he gets in, and then he visits his uncle. That same juiced up spider ends up biting Miles. He passes out, and then after his father comes to get him, we see his powers activate. Putting two and two together, we have another Prowler by the name of Aaron Davis. So let's recap. Prowler, an original Spider-Man villain who was introduced in issue 78 of The Amazing Spider-Man, sneaks into Norman Osborn's spot, and he's one of the OG Spider-Man villains as Green Goblin. He carries a spider, the result of an experiment that bites a character who ends up becoming a Spider-Man. That's Miles' origin story. We'll get into his powers a little more later, but it's important to note that his origin is essentially the same. Hilariously enough, Peter Parker of the first Ultimate Comic reboot states that he was bit by a one-of-a-kind spider, which apparently isn't true. The notable differences that people are going to mention, and we'll address that, are the slight power differences and the fact that his parents are around and the family dynamic. Those are largely overstated, but Let's back up a bit because him being intended to be a copy is so hilariously blatant. Miles' first book actually starts with a conversation between Norman Osborn and a scientist by the name of Marcus. He first asks him, is he a fan of mythology, and then goes on a tangent about Athena and the myth of Arcane. Only it's the same damn conversation in the first Ultimate Comic Spider-Man in the year 2000. It's almost verbatim the same conversation that's happening, only Norman Osborn in Miles' comic is talking to another doctor, not Justin. Even the spider walking on Norman's glove it's like the same panel. This shouldn't be surprising because the same person that wrote the original Spider-Man comic, the Ultimate Spider-Man comic, wrote 
the Miles story. And because Norman acknowledges that Spider-Man was the result of one of his earlier versions of that super soldier eyes formula in a spider, one could see it as a nod, but that's stupid considering he's having the same exact conversation right after a single wandering spider gets misplaced, which ends up biting someone, giving them powers. The slight difference in details are superficial as the core events are the exact same. It makes sense because it was written, again, by the same person. Miles has the same origin story and over the next 10 years, he has basically no iconic storylines and all of his main villains are old Spider-Man villains. The fact of the matter is this, there's hardly anything regarding his personality, even his nerdism, that we haven't seen from Peter Parker or a version of Peter Parker. Even his Venom powers we already have seen from other characters with spider-like powers like Spider-Woman. He shares most similarities with the Ultimate Universe version of Peter Parker, which dealt with a young Peter, especially that second volume where the art made him look really young. Even when Miles quit being Spider-Man, they tried to make it look like that Spider-Man No More storyline classic image of the Spidey suit in the trash. Miles' rise to popularity can't really be credited to the books and still isn't. Into the Spider-Verse obviously put him on the map. Again, due to the social clout that comes with the character, he's always going to do better in movies or video game setting than he ever will in the comics. That's because those are largely normie-centric mediums that are easy to digest. But you have people that say things like he was brought into Marvel's main universe because he was more popular than Peter Parker. There's nothing that indicates that and it's false history. At no point in time ever has this character been more popular than Peter Parker and that shouldn't even be a controversial statement. So let's look at the data real quick. Comicron and ICV2 are generally looked at the best sources of information to see where the comic sales are at. Despite Ultimate Comics being another number one issue and it being heralded with all of the media pushes of how important and progressive this was, because little Johnny, I guess, can now see himself. He can finally see himself. It barely made the top 10 comics in September of 2011. It didn't even get 90,000 units sold. By the third issue, it had fallen all the way down to number 37. Two issues of Amazing Spider-Man sold better. By the end of that year, this ever so popular Spider-Man managed to get outsold by three other Spider-Man books that were centered around Peter Parker. It was being shielded to the oblivion by the media and the critics and it simply didn't do that well. The year-end numbers show that it was number 45 on the year-end sales behind other Spider-Man books. A few years later, they do the classic reboot gimmick and it's even worse this time around. Miles Morales' Ultimate Spider-Man debuted at number 36 according to Comicron, selling only 45,000 units. To put that in perspective, that's less than ISOM number one, and I damn sure didn't have the resources or the shield media backing it. And ISOM was sold directly to customers, and all the comic shops that had it sold out of it. These Comicron numbers, you have to keep this in mind, are just numbers that are sold to the shop. Who knows how many of these rotted on the shelves? By the third issue, it was number 78 at 37,000 units. By the end of the year, the best Miles book was only number 403. This character had virtually no steam behind it despite Marvel throwing all of their resources at it. His best performance didn't come until his third volume, which was an absolute bait and switch in 2016. It's the first and really the only series that was just named Spider-Man without making the distinction that it was Miles Morales. This book debuted fairly well at number four, almost hitting 100,000 copies, but by the second book, it was down to number 15 behind, again, two other books headlined by Peter. It remained this way for the rest of this run, even through Civil War. The year-end sales tell it all that Spider-Man book was only number 79 on the list due to that number one. The second issue was way down at 340. Let's put that in even more perspective. Outside of that first issue, that bait and switch, there were almost 30, yes, 30 books that are just 
based on Peter Parker's Spider-Man that was in front of it. This ranges from The Amazing Spider-Man to even that Spider-Man and Deadpool series. So for the first years, despite all of this push by way of Marvel and the critics, there's no indication that shows that it was doing well compared to Peter, but also compared to the rest of the field. And again, shouldn't be controversial. Despite there being little to no interest in this character, Marvel did the smart thing by putting out into the Spider-Verse the animated movie. Now simply put, it was a movie that was well received. Though that $375 million box office seems like nothing compared to the other MCU movies, but I will not pretend as if others didn't enjoy it, even if just for its animation, this is arguably the best received version of the character. The second best is probably the Spider-Man game. Purposely, Miles gets another reboot though in the comics, so that's a brand new character with like four reboots in seven years. And despite having this critically acclaimed movie that dropped almost identical in time frame, Miles Morales' Spider-Man only pushed 57,000 books to stores. Again, if you include all three different covers of ISOM, we beat that. It didn't even beat Superior Spider-Man, nor the 12th issue of The Amazing Spider-Man. The second in January of 2019 fell all the way down to 57, and of course, it goes down from there. Year end sales in 2018, that issue one didn't even crack the top 200. None of the issues from its own series even made the top 500 books in 2019. The highest book that Miles led on that list was at 223 and it was an absolute carnage tie-in if y'all remember, which was stupid, they did that right after the War of the Realms. We covered a lot of that on this channel. So during a time at his peak popularity, he managed to probably do worse than the other series. In 2020, his best performing book is his The End comic. You remember that series where they just kill off characters? And that barely made the top 200, but that headlining series doesn't even crack the top 200 on any issue. His best year end performance came in last year in 2021 with the 25th issue at the number 30 spot. Unfortunately, there are three other Spider-Man books that are also in front of him that focus on Peter. It'll be interesting to see what the year end 2022 numbers will show, but it'll show the same story, let's be real. Be mad at me all you want for bringing this up, but the facts are the facts. His comics, nor his trades are supported by the people that stand him on social media. This is a character you pretend to like to either spite your ideological enemies because you think it takes it to them, or you just like the idea of him. And that's fine, just say that. But stop pretending that the customers have crowned him. No data that supports this exists. If as many people that get irate on my post actually went to go buy his books, I wouldn't have to make this video. This video may actually incentivize these pretenders to go buy the video out of spite, more than the millions of dollars that Marvel spent throwing it behind the character, so I guess you're welcome. By the way, he just got another reboot not too long ago. Look, I'll more than concede that normies are fond of him, and he may strike gold with depictions that are outside the comics. The only thing that I reject are those claims that claim he's doing better than what he actually is. Even being brought into like Marvel's main universe, he's not doing as well as you'd like to think that he is. Now, on a serious note, I believe this character to be one of the lazy comic book creations in recent years. That's the artist in me. I think it's disgusting that so many people try to hide behind the element of race when people are critical of the character, as if to say that you have an issue with black characters. No, dipstick, the problem is despite all of this money flowing through the mega corporations that have Marvel and DC, they're still resorting to tokenization as the gimmick. It's boring and it's lazy. People don't have an issue supporting new characters. Just do the work, and get people enthusiastic about the project instead of taking the shortcuts. It's what we did with the Ripperverse, as much as you hate us. Wherever you're viewing the content, 
I appreciate you. If you enjoyed it, you may be interested in my comic book company, Riververse Comics. Our first book and campaign, I Sum Number One, brought in $3.7 million with tens of thousands of satisfied customers. Visit Riververse.com to check out our store and stay up to date with the latest campaigns from one of the hottest new comic book companies. Also, my first big step towards a parallel economy was the development of my personal website, EricDJuly.com. This entirely replaced my Patreon. Now, if you enjoy this content, please consider becoming a member over at the website. We have an ever-expanding list of perks for various membership tiers, a form, and a phone app. Some of these perks will even benefit you if you're fans of the Ripperverse. Anyway, I appreciate you so much for being a supporter and or customer. I even got a little love for my haters. <laughs>